I want to go ahead and uh, I know this, it rarely happens, much less does it happen two Sundays in a row. Um, it's not because I was ill prepared or anything like that, but I feel that I need to go in a different direction this morning. So just keep those notes. Uh, they will show up again. And uh, if not, they'll be collector's items. They'll be like a miss, be like a misstamped coin that, you know, is, it becomes valuable. Um, <clears throat> we got a good start with uh, fullness last week, um, but it came forth a little different than it had been laid out. We talked about uh, Naomi's journey to Moab. Uh, today, uh, I wanted to talk about the flavoring of fullness, but I do feel that I need to go in a different direction. There have been some things on my heart for several days and uh, crushing things, not, not like death crushing or bad crushing, but just a heavy burden. And um, when I woke this morning, um, I, 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 I had things that were circulating in my mind all night. And when I woke, I felt the Lord very simply say to my spirit, say this to them. And it was one sentence that'll be at the end of all of this. But um, I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about the burden of my heart, not, not anything on your notes that you have. I want to talk to you about the, the burden on my heart uh, in regard to mid-course corrections and, uh, and being open to what the Lord is saying to us. There is a scripture, uh, I, I don't believe we ought to preach about dreams. I, um, even if a dream is from the Lord, it can, it can um, be supported by scripture or it can support scripture, but we don't preach from dreams. We preach from the word. But I had a dream that called my attention back to some verses that the Lord had put on my heart. Back in my journal in late November, early December, the Lord had spoken a verse to me that I'm going to share to you, with you in just a moment. But I first want to tell you a dream. Um, and Father, we ask you to help us today to be on track and help us to hear you. Um, Father, we're not doing this for a crowd. We, we realize whenever we do something live stream, we realize it goes out to everybody and not everybody's on the same page with us. But Lord, we also don't want anyone in the church to miss what we feel you're saying to us. So we ask for your help. We ask for your direction and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For several days, a couple of weeks or so, I have had this heaviness about um, us really being sure that we're hearing the Lord and, and not just doing stuff, not just doing church. About seven years ago, as best I can figure, I would have to go through my journals to pin it down, but about seven years ago, um, I had a dream that uh, began with me being a tourist in New York City which I've done before, I've been there before, and I was familiar with the places I was, but as I was doing the tourist thing in New York City, um, I had flown there, and the Lord told me to go into a hospital. And I went into a hospital, and when I went into the hospital, it, I saw like a spirit of death that came over the hospital. I saw that the medical system in the hospital collapsed. They were unable to take care of those that were sick. I don't know, I, I, I had no idea then why the medical system collapsed. And I'm not even sure that I'm prepared to say this, that, or the other about the medical system. But in the, in the dream, it wasn't that medicine was wrong, is that the medical professionals were not able to keep up with the demands. Um, on top of that, uh, a radio broadcast said there had been um, new attacks in our big cities, um, uh, uh, attacks that were terrorist in nature. And then on top of that, another news report that there was international tension, that there was something happening in Asia that was 
was uh, terribly frightening in regard to war and conflict, and China in particular. And um, in this dream, uh, I began to see the death in the hospital. I, I could see the terrorism in the city. I could see the news headlines about war. And the Lord told me to go to a place I will show you. Well, when you got to understand this old boy, when I'm out of town and things get boogery, the place God shows me is home. I want to go home, you know. Um, but I, I remember thinking, okay, I got to get home. I've got to get back to my family. Um, but the Lord said, I'm going to, he, he used that phrase twice. I'm going to, I, I need you to go to the place that I will show you. And he said, get your go bag. And in this dream in my hotel room, I had prepared a bag, you know, a get out of Dodge bag or a to go bag, whatever you want to call it with necessities. And I remembered, I went and grabbed the bag. He told me, leave everything else. Just grab your bag. And I said, uh, Lord, uh, I, you know, I thought I'm, I'm going to go to the host uh, to the airport, fly home. At that point, flights were shut down. Airport was shut down. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to get wherever it is you want me to go. And he told me to go to a place that he said, buy a bus ticket. And um, I went to the bus ticket or, or to the bus station and uh, I bought a ticket, but I said, Lord, I don't, I don't want to ride on a bus. I'm, I'm not a fan of buses. I've done it. And uh, I, I don't want to do this. He said, do you want to get out of the city? I said, yes, I do. Then buy a bus ticket. And um, although on the way there, there were people that I passed that were being spoken to by individuals, get on the bus. You have to get on the bus. Um, and when I got on the bus, the Lord said, how hard is it for people to understand that I've told them to get out of Babylon, to get out of this system? And I knew at that time in the dream, we were talking about more than New York City. It was a system. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not don't mean to be offensive to anyone from New York. I don't mean New York is Babylon, but I'm saying it was a dream and things overlay, you know, and, and layers compound. And um, I got on the bus and I remembered thinking how difficult it is to get anybody on the bus. The Lord, I'm not the only one the Lord's telling to get out of the city, um, but it's hard to get people on there. They, you know, some were saying, I love the city or this, this is where my job is. And uh, I've, I've lived here all my life. And again, I want to say, I don't think it was about New York. I think it was about a system. And I got on the bus. I was, I was very uncomfortable. I felt, uh, I felt in danger. I felt at risk. And I remember I got near the back of the bus as far back as I could go and just kind of huddled up in a corner, held my bag in my lap. And I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, I'll show you where to go. There's a mission that I want you to go to. And I, the, the dream ended with me saying, I can't believe how people are reluctant to get on the bus. And as we pulled out of the city, the city was going up in flames and there were all kinds of great difficulty. I woke up. That was about seven years ago. A few days ago, I found myself in the same bus. I mean, in a dream. Same bus driver, same people. But things had shifted now. Uh, the, the atmosphere was one of panic as we left the town. We're still trying to leave the town. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was like we were still in a town. I mean, I had, we had left the town, but it was like we were still in a town. And we were uh, a different scenario. The, the bus was no longer a place of distress. Now... I'm sitting up on the front seat where I can talk to the driver and somebody is sitting by me. I've gotten rid of my bag and I have just a handful of papers and a little water bottle. And I'm sitting there and the light turns red. We're the first vehicle at the intersection. We, you know, we could have turned right. We could have gone straight, except the light turned red. The light stayed red for about six hours. Now, um, in the worst traffic conditions, traffic lights don't stay red for six hours. But that wasn't the unusual thing. The unusual thing is that we were all just talking and chatting and we were having the best time ever. Um, you know, it was like, oh, you know, and, and I remember in the dream thinking, I must have really learned patience because I'm, I'm willing to just sit here. And um, after a while, I said to the bus driver, I said, all we have to do is turn right. 
and we won't have to go ahead. We just need to turn right. And he looked at me and said, don't you understand? The authorities will not let us turn right. We have to stay here till the light changes. And I said, how are they going to know? Just turn right. And he said, no, we're told we can't turn right. I'm not going to turn right. We're told we can't go straight or turn left. We're just going to sit here. I said, well, we've been here for hours. And um, he said, That's, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to break the rules. And uh, some other things happened that it would take me too long to go into. But we're sitting there on the bus. and We'd never left. And um, I, I woke up. I, and honestly, my first thought was, I am getting this patience thing down. <laughs> And I thought, well, maybe the Lord is saying we're about to enter a time of real restriction. Maybe, maybe the COVID thing's going to resurface and we're going to have uh, all kinds of restrictions and mandates and, and just be patient, you know. And um, I, I, that was where my mind was. A little bit later, the Lord began to speak to me. And now you got to understand, this is a dream, part one, part two, same details, about seven years apart. And um, the Lord spoke to me and said, before I couldn't get anyone on the bus. They didn't take the warning seriously. He said, now these years later, I can't get anyone off the bus. I can't get the bus to move. There's a spirit of passivity that has gripped the church of the Lord Jesus. It's what was but I was picking up from the Lord and he said, in what world would you be so comfortable as to sit at a red light for over six hours? He said, in what world would your bladder let you sit at a red light for six hours? And the Lord said, there is a spirit of passivity and a spirit of substitution that has, has descended upon my people and they are settling for the wrong responses to what's happening around them. Now, I, this isn't a thing about you've got to defy the government or you've got to defy mandates. That's not where this thing was taking me. But I began to understand that some people in the, in the difficulty that we're facing, some people have just, they've opted for anxiety. They've got on a bus of anxiety. You know, they, they stay there, they, they, they think they're in faith because they say, boy, there's no way out of this unless Jesus helps us. And that's their effort at faith. And, um, but they are worried. They are worried about their job. They're worried about their children. They're worried about their health. They're worried about everything. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be worried, but I'm saying whenever anxiety comes, you put anxiety in its place and then you keep living and you keep going forward. In other words, there's a time to get off the bus. Now, you got to also understand this. Um, when I say I woke up, one more thing happened in the second dream. I told the bus driver, I said, I didn't know when I got on the bus where I was going, but I said, I know where I'm going now. I know the city I'm going. I know the building I'm going to, and I need to get there. And he said, it's not time to move. Well, finally, finally, we got there. And the dream ended with me getting off the bus and finding out that the building God had sent me to was now uh, half destroyed. It was empty. It had been abandoned. And I sat on the counter after saying, you know, this used to be this and this used to be this. It was a building I was familiar with in another city. And I remember sitting on a countertop, you know, that was covered in dust and, and, um, an animal dung, you know, like from rats and stuff. Uh, I wiped it off. I sat down and I began to teach people in the group. I said, this is what happens when we don't move with God. What has been built is lost and what has been established is forgotten. I said, pull out your water bottles and let me tell you the way this building used to look. And let me tell you what used to go on in this building. We've been on the bus far too long. Now that's at the point that I, that I woke up. Some people have decided that anxiety will be their response. Some people have decided that anger will be their response. 
Um, I, I've said this, I've said this several times and you probably wish I'd quit saying it, but I, I'm, I, am, I am amazed at the spirit of anger and the spirit of offense that has pervaded our country. And I wouldn't be surprised that it pervaded and, and permeates culture. What is a shocker to me is that it's in the church. The church has followed the steps of culture. And instead of being a light on a hill, we've now become part of the darkness. And we have, we have uh, said, if we get angry enough, if we point enough fingers, if we can do this, that, or the other enough and just let folks know we're not going to take it anymore, that it'll solve our problem. But it just fuels the fire. It fuels the fire and nothing gets resolved. It's an old verse. Well, I guess technically all verses are old verses. But the scripture is right when it says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Um, our politicians have embraced almost as a whole, have embraced anger. There is such venom and such hatred one side against the other. Uh, it, it, you look at politics and it's, it's almost hopeless because of the anger. You say, well, no, we're just one election away from getting things the way we want, or we're two elections away, we'll get it back the way we want. And uh, loved ones, we've got to understand that our country is so divided right now and so angry right now. It's not that we have this broad base, this is the way it used to be. There used to be a broad base of commonality with some extreme people on the left and some extreme people on the right. But America in general was a common place as far as dreams and expectations and culture. We've lost that. We, we are now two cultures with two sets of people that have two different realities. I'm not even talking about right and wrong. I'm talking about this side has this reality. This side has this reality. And there is very little, very little common ground where anything can be worked out. And it is such a slim margin that the signature from the pen of a president or a two-year midterm election can turn everything totally the other way. But the problem is that in two years from that, another signature can turn everything back. We are, we are not in a place of, of, of uh, resolution. We are in a place of just topsy-turvy turmoil. We're like, uh, I think it was Winchester in Virginia. Uh, it, it, was, it was at a critical place during the Civil War. And in the four years of the Civil War, it changed hands 76 times. We're in a position that our nation can be just like that. I'm, again, don't, don't look at me like I'm being political. It, it, I don't care if you're left or right. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. That's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm saying there's no consensus. We are driven by anger. Um, some people lock into anger, and churches do the same thing. I've given up on the church. I, you know, I love Jesus, but I hate religion. And we, we, have, we have embraced either anxiety, which makes us too afraid to get off the bus, or we've embraced anger that says, I'll get off the bus, but I'll burn down whatever I see. And then the most dangerous place of all is the place of just abandonment. We're, we're, we're not caving in to anxiety. We're not caving into anger, but we're just saying there's no hope. We're just, whatever happens will happen. You know, there's, there's just no hope. It's abandonment. And loved ones, I believe that's where the majority of Christians are. I believe that's where the majority of churches are. And I think that it will be something that will be devastating to the church in America unless we understand we can't just sit back because somebody says we can't turn right. And, and I'm not talking about breaking the law. I'm talking about caving in to the spirit of Antichrist. Let me tell you what Daniel said about the spirit of Antichrist. His job, or about Antichrist, his job will be to wear out the saints of the Most High God. And I believe the number one agenda in the church of the Lord Jesus is to disorient 
us so that we don't know up from down. We don't know right from wrong. I had a friend that was a pilot in World War II, and this sounds like a fairy tale <coughs> because we have such incredible technology now that we didn't have in the days of World War II. Thank you. He was a pilot um, in the Pacific uh, flying a, a single engine plane. And he said um, that the waters of the Pacific, if the weather conditions were right, they were so beautiful. They were blue, just like the sky. And he said, uh, you couldn't tell where the water began and the sky ended. He said it was just two matching blues. And he said, and when there were no clouds in the sky and the seas were calm, he said there were, there were times that if you didn't have uh, a little gauge on your plane, not altitude, but it was called attitude, it showed you the attitude of the plane. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you this or this? And he said on that attitude gauge, you have to have the wing. If you have your wings flat, if the nose and tail match, you're going straight. If you do a dive, the attitude does this, or you do a climb, the attitude does this. He said, the most frightening thing I've ever experienced in my life, he said, it happened twice, is when my gauge went out and I couldn't tell my attitude. He said, I honestly, he said, coming out of, of uh, uh, rough conditions or whatever, he said, uh, or, or maybe out of an a, a aerial combat, he said, when my attitude gauge was out, he said, I looked and I sometimes could not tell. He said, I'm strapped in. He said, I could not tell if I was flying upside down or right side up. He said, when I looked at the blue, is that the blue of the sky or is that the blue of the ocean? He said, when your attitude goes, all orientation goes. And you may be flying upside down, but everything in you tells you you're flying right side up. I said, how did you, how did you deal with that? He said, I learned to carry coins in my jacket pocket. He said, and when I didn't know if I was right side up or upside down, he said, I'd hold up a coin and let it go. And if it went that way, I was upside down. <laughs> he said, it only happened twice and it doesn't happen long. He said, there are other factors that you acclimate. But he said, it's a terrifying feeling to not know if I'm right side up or upside down. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. He wants to disorient you through your attitude, if I may take it a little bit further than is probably legitimate to do. He wants to get your attitude gauge off so that you know up and down, but your life has been so difficult, you're not sure if up is down or down is up. He wants to disorient you. He wants to defile you. He wants to fill your mind with thoughts that God cannot be trusted. He wants to fill your heart with dismay and distress the enemy, the enemy wants you to be afraid to get off the bus. <coughs> if he can't get you to stay, uh, to keep, if he can't keep you from getting on the bus, once you get on the bus, he wants you to think the bus is your place of safety when the bus is only to move you from here to there. We have put our trust in too many of the wrong things. Now I want to share with you two verses that God began to speak to me in November and December. And God has brought it back to my heart. I, 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 I felt like it was a verse for me. I didn't feel like it was a, something to preach on. But I can't get away from this verse. I, I can't get away from, in fact, two of them. But one of them especially. It's in Isaiah 26, 20. And I don't know if they've had time to, to put it together, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you the reference again. Isaiah 26, 20 from the new uh, King James Version, I believe it is. The Lord spoke this to me in late November and December. And he said, you must grasp this. He said, this will be the most critical verse for you in 2022. And this is what it says. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. He said, I want you to understand that it is so important that you come into my presence. 
it is so important that you put everything else on secondary level or put everything else on hold. I want you to shut yourself in with me. He said, I want you to enter your chambers. I want you to shut your doors behind you. <coughs> and the language is interesting. He said, hide yourself as it were for a little moment. The, the, the language of hide yourself as it were. He's not saying go hide. He's not saying buy land in Wyoming, which I'd love to have some. Um, he, he's not saying I want you to go hide. But he's saying, when he says hide, as it were, he says, I want you to treat this coming into my presence as though you were hiding from someone. Take it that seriously. He said, hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Now, if I had another 20 minutes, we could talk about the meaning of that verse in its original context. <laughs> there are a couple of possibilities we don't have time to go into today. But I wanted to bring that verse to you. I want to, you've got to let God speak it to your heart. But I want to bring this verse to you and I want to challenge you not to hide, but I want you to hide in his presence. I want you to enter your prayer closet and shut the door behind you. I want you to act as though you were hiding from whatever is distracting you, whatever is belaboring your, your uh, uh, or belittling your faith and belaboring your efforts to serve the Lord. Loved ones, we, I, and I've said this for years, I want to spend the rest of my life telling people how important it is to have a life of intimacy with God. Amen. And I want you to know there are, are days ahead where you're not going to be able to tell if you're flying upside down or right side up unless your attitude gauge is working. There are times that you're going to think everything's fine because I punched in my verses and I punched in my old, you know, routines. I'm doing things and I'm just going to hold on and be happy. But God is giving you a mid-course correction. The other verse, not nearly as powerful in my heart as the first one, but Proverbs 21, 21. He who follows after righteousness and mercy finds life. And he has made that just leap off the pages at me. We are following all kinds of voices. We're following all kinds of formulas. We're following all kinds of stuff saying we're in this for life. But loved ones, we need to follow righteousness and mercy. I've never in my life lived in an era of less mercy than right now. Not only in our political system, but even in the church we're, we're thinking that we are the spiritual ones when we point at others and say, you don't know squat. I know about this and you don't know about this. This denomination is right. This denomination is wrong. Loved ones, this is, and I do believe we need to know the difference between truth and error. And I do need, believe we need to walk in the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word as never before. But we have taken upon us a stench. And it's a stench of death because it's superiority. It's pointing the finger at others. And it's saying, you don't know, you're not right. If you don't go to this meeting, you're not part of what God's doing. You're not part of the remnant if you don't hold to this idea. You want life, you seek for righteousness. That means get your own life straight Amen. and then show mercy you, to others. You say, well, I'm not going to say they're right when they're not right. I didn't say that. I said, show mercy. That means get your foot off their throat. Pull your spiritual gun away from their head. Learn to pray for instead of praying against. I want to commend Justin and the, the, prayer, the prayer warriors that are rising up in this church. I'm so thankful. And Justin has done a masterful job of teaching us all that we pray about things and we pray for things. We don't pray against things. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 
I want to give you four things that I believe are the heart of God for us today. I hope you'll remember those two verses, Isaiah 26, 20 and Proverbs 21, 1. Here's number one. I, I, none of these are new, but one is, I, I've got to get it off my heart. It's the last thing. Um, here's number one. Remember what Jesus said, you shall, in this world, you shall have tribulation. We, and I, loved ones, I know I'm, I'm like a broken record, but I tell you, I'm, I'm trying to be a shepherd that leads and feeds and protects. Uh, that's part of the problem of the church in America. We think pastors are just chaplains to officiate over weddings and funerals and take care of benevolence cases. I want to tell you, in biblical times, a shepherd, they all look like Clint Eastwood. Like, like a young Clint Eastwood. They would lead the sheep. They didn't let the sheep choose where to go. They would feed the sheep. They knew where the grass was, but they also were willing to protect the sheep and to fight lions and to fight bears and to fight thieves, to fight wolves. They, they understood that this thing called Christianity is not a life where you sit out in the grass and play a banjo and sing Kumbaya. The, the, the flock is at stake. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But I believe that we do everything we can to let comfort replace consecration. And we do everything we can to, to let prosperity be a good substitution for holiness. And we chase voices that are going to tell us everything's going to be fine. We, we have fallen in our own Pentecostal ranks. We've fallen into the trap of making Jesus God 2.0, a better, kinder, gentler God than the God of the Old Testament. And loved ones, I'm sorry, but if you think that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and the God of the New Testament is a God of mercy. You don't know your Bible. You simply don't know your Bible. There's plenty of love from God in the Old Testament. Oh man, you want to know the love of God. Read the words of those prophets. Watch God interact with his people. You say, yeah, but he was also pretty wrathful. Well, I encourage you to read the book of Revelation. That's in the New Testament. And there's plenty of wrath to go around in the book of Revelation. He's not a God of moods. He's not even a God of sides. He is perfect wrath and he's perfect mercy. That's why Jesus was said to be full of grace and truth. He wasn't a mix of grace and truth. He was complete grace and he was complete truth, which includes judgment. We have customized God. You know, you can go online and build your car and say, this is what I want. We've done that with God. And we have cursed, we have shaken our fist, we have walked away from churches and pastors that refuse to fall into the trap of making a God to our own liking. And we need to understand that there is a God who is just and sovereign and righteous. And he is a God not only of mercy, but he's a God of wrath. I don't understand why we get so upset. I don't, know, I don't know what's happening, Pastor. Something's not right. Something's not right. <coughs> Loved ones, we live in a world and we live in a church age. And Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this age. Paul said, you're going to be hated. You're going to have trouble in this age. Why is it hard for us to grasp that what Jesus said is happening? What Paul said is happening. Doesn't mean we like it, and it doesn't mean that it's all bad. 
But loved ones, we have to understand that this is what's called life. This world is still broken. We still live in a broken system. You say, well, not me. I ain't broken. I'm saved. Oh, you're more broken than you think. No, you are saved and you are going to heaven. But this world is not fixed yet. This world is not out from under the curse yet. We are redeemed people that are living in a cursed world. And when Jesus comes, everything will be set right. But it's foolishness for us to think that everything's going to be Jim Dandy in our lives. Because we've made Jesus our Lord. In the eternal sense, that's true but not in the fleshly sense. You will have tribulation. Number two, I want to encourage you to seek the presence. Uh, let, me, let me be sure you understand the first thing. We are going to have trouble. We are in a system that hates God. We are in a nation that is increasingly turning from God. And we are in a post-Christian America. And, and any, I don't think there's any way we can deny that. We will have tribulation. We will have persecution. That's why one of our major prayer points is prayer for the persecuted church. But number two, we must, instead of seeking comfort, we must seek the presence. God is coming in a way that I doubt any of us have ever seen before. There's going to be a move of the Spirit that we don't get excited about because we can't comprehend what God is about to do. But I'm telling you, <coughs> God is coming and we need to learn to seek the presence. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that we are just dating the presence. We'll show up for Word, Spirit, and Power Conference. We'll drive a couple of states away because we hear they're having good services. Or we follow a certain type of music because it makes me feel the presence. Or I'll follow a ministry because it makes me feel the presence. And there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things unless you have become a groupie. You see, you're dating the presence. You're not willing to bring presence home. Your, your home is no different than your neighbor's home because you're not willing to pay the price to have the presence of God in your home. You're not willing to pray the presence of God over your children. You're not willing to pray the presence of God over your own life. So we date the presence and we demand that wherever we go, Better have a good date plan for me. My word, I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> Number three, loved ones, more than any time in my lifetime, we are in a place we've got to start expecting mid-course corrections. Because things that have worked or things that we have gotten comfortable with, not that they're bad, and God doesn't have to do everything new. I mean, there's some people that are so fascinated. Everything's got to be new. No, I think we need to return to some roots. But I also think we need to understand that we can make an idol out of a good thing when we're not willing to let God do a mid-course correction. Back in 1983, the year I was born. That's way too much laughter. Uh, I was pastoring a little church in Alabama and in September uh, Korean Airlines flight 007 was shot down crashed in the sea of Japan 269 people died the, it, it, there was a lot of chaos for a few days but it was obvious what happened a Russian fighter had shot it down or, or I think two of them had shot it down because it had wandered into airspace, um, uh, to Soviet airspace. The, the Korean airline says we, we never came, the closest we came was 170 miles to your airspace. We were never in your airspace. You attacked us 
and you killed 269 people, including 20 who were under the age of 12. And the world was very, very tense. 1983 was a tough year for the relations between the United States and Russia. And to make a long story short, some of this didn't come out for over a decade, but to make a long story short, the Flight 007 was flying from New York to Anchorage and then from Anchorage to Seoul. And what happened, now you've got to remember the, the, uh, the positioning satellites were nothing then like they are now. But there were several ways that you stayed within a seven and a half mile corridor when you flew to be sure you were on track. And if you got out of that corridor, all kinds of alarms would sound from the ground and what have you. And um, what happened is the pilots took off slightly off course. It was such a slight deviation that nobody thought anything when they took off. And it was about six hours into the flight before that slight deviation ended up putting them 60 miles into Soviet airspace. And the, the uh, geo-positioning technology that we all enjoy on our phones and GPS and everything today, the reason that is so popular today, the United States was the only country that had that technology then. But President Reagan said, if this kind of thing can happen, we have to share our technology with the whole world so this kind of thing doesn't happen again. And that's what they did. But the point I'm trying to make is after all was said and done, the, the, the deviation from course over the six hours would amount to a, a, just a little less than 1%. So close that they didn't realize it until it was too late. And there were at least five places along the way that realized something was wrong but did nothing that generated enough interest to adjust the course. Loved ones, I want to tell you, these, th this, wasn't, this wasn't uncommon what happened in the natural, nor is it uncommon in the spiritual. I'm, I'm afraid that we are in a time where we must hear from the Holy Spirit. As families, as individuals, as churches, um, I, I got a note from um, a, a pastor friend of mine here in town, or an email, not a note. Uh, he said, I just want you to know I'm praying for you all to know what to do with the land. He said, I'm just, I understand you're having a little confusion over what to do with the land. And I wrote back, I said, we, we're not, we don't have any confusion over the land. What, what did you hear? He said, well, I just heard you all don't know what to do with the land yet. And I said, that's not confusion. I said, we are very clear in our direction on what to do with the land. And, and he said, what? And I said, wait. <laughs> We're not confused. Loved ones, God is going to put us in the place where we find ourselves on hold, where we find ourselves adjusting. And it's not because God said, oh, I thought that would work, but things have never been this bad before. Let me try something else. And it's not because we're not listening. God is weaning us from the thought that we can direct our own lives. God is weaning churches from the idea that we are sufficient unto ourselves. And I told him, I said, no, we're not in confusion. We're just waiting on the Lord. And he said, oh, he, he was being funny. He said, I remember waiting on the Lord. I heard about that in my home church when I was a little boy. And he was being sarcastic. He was... He went on to say, in my denomination, we don't even talk about that. We just make business decisions. And I thought, oh God, thank you. Thank you for the moments, like in Scripture, where Paul said, we're going this way. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not. Now the Holy Spirit said, no, not that way, this way. The Holy Spirit just said, no. Paul said, okay, then we'll go this way. And the Holy Spirit said, no. Loved ones, don't be afraid because you and I are in situations right now where we're hearing a lot of no's. I know that. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about life. 
we're hearing a lot of no's and we think God doesn't have a plan or God doesn't love me or God's not keeping his promise. But loved ones, he is developing something in you that I'm telling you, I've lived long enough to tell you this, the greatest treasure you will have in your life or one of the greatest treasures you'll have in your life is the ability to have the relationship of God where that peace is disturbed and you sense God saying, not this way, not that way. Not this, but that. We've got to expect mid-course corrections. Now, here's number four, okay? And this is what I want to, to leave with. This, is, this morning, I went to sleep um, just feeling so much churning, but I had every intention of preaching the message that you have the notes for. I, I had kind of a spiritual night, we'll just call it that. But when I woke up, when I woke up, the first thing I heard, it, all, it, it was so real. I didn't know if it was audible or in my spirit. But I heard, tell them this, or this is what I want you to tell them. And this is what it was. Tell them, it won't always be this way. I was wrestling with confusion. I was wrestling with disappointments. I was wrestling with God. Where is your promise? And I, I know better than to know that God lied. I know God's not going to lie. I know God always keeps his promise. But loved ones, I want to tell you the truth. There are times that I wonder if I heard right. There are times I wonder, Lord, I know I heard right. Why aren't you doing this? Now, if, if you'll let me wrap this up with this nice, pretty bow here at the end. He said it won't always be this way. And I said, I, I, I tried to process it. And then as I was praying this morning, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to have the joy of believing like a child. And I, I've preached so many sermons on childlike faith, and I don't think any of them hit it right. Childhood faith is simple. Childhood faith does believe, but childhood faith's full of questions. But I tell you the thing that I believe about the faith of a child. See, I believe that my childhood was one of the happiest times of my life. You say, not mine. Boy, you didn't have my daddy or you didn't have, you didn't grow up in my neighborhood. I, I understand. I, I'm just giving my testimony. I believe that childhood was the happiest time of my, or one of the happiest times of my life. But can I tell you something? It wasn't because my faith was so simple. In fact, it was rather complex. Because when I was a child, the thing that made life so exciting to me is I'm not always going to be this little. It's not going to always be this way. I'm going to get my own car. I'm going to drive through Burger King whenever I want to drive <laughs> through Burger King. I remember distinctly thinking of leaving my elementary school, going to a new school, junior high school. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, because you're in the sixth grade that's the, back then, that was elementary school. You're top of the mountain, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the biggest and best of everything. Now you're about to move into a school where you're now the newbies. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I want to do this. And then I was watching the kids from the junior high walk home. And I said, boy, the girls are a lot prettier in junior high. I can do this. I can do this. And every year was thrilled with a, it's not always going to be this way. I don't know if I'm making sense to you or not, but I loved my childhood because God was saying, Every day is a new day. And it's not always, you may not like this teacher, but you're not going to have her next year. It's not always going to be this way. Now listen to me, loved ones. I know there are some of you, I know it because I feel for you. 
When you send in these prayer requests, they don't just get checked off and put in a file. We pray for you. I know what some of you are going through. I know the disappointment that some of you are having. And you don't even know that I know. I, I know what it's like for a parent to say, God, I know you love my child like you love me, but why aren't you doing this for my child? Why is my grandchild going through this difficulty? Why is my daughter that wants a family in a situation where they can't have children, why are you doing this, Lord? And we have questions that we would not dare ask anybody except those that are closest to us. I want to tell you that God is in control of your life. Why does he wait? I don't know. I could give you three or four things that might be the reason, but I don't know. I, I'm, I, I can't preach a sermon to your pain and you'll go away saying, oh, okay, I got it. No. I, 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 I can't tell you how many times through the years people have actually been angry with me. I knew they weren't really angry with me, but they were angry because they want an answer and no sermon can provide the answer to your suffering. I know that. I, I don't take that personally. We all have things. We don't know why. And one-liners don't help us. And hour-long sermons don't always help us. And people's testimonies can, but they don't always help us. Sometimes we're left at the end of the day where we are being told no. And there's no reason for it. That we can see, yeah, pastor, and I'm mad. I know, I know what it's like to be mad. So what do I do about it? Let's remember, it won't always be this way. Well, when? I don't know, but it won't always be this way. When is my bank account going to fatten and when is my waist going to slim? When am I going to have the woman of my dreams? When am I going to have my child? When am, when am I going to get a break? For God's sake, when am I going to get a break? I don't know. But I tell you what God Almighty put in my heart to tell you in your place of difficulty right now, it won't always be this way. It won't always be this way. Well, what do I do? I don't know. Justin, what should they do? You got any ideas? Corey? Hold tight. And remember, it won't be this way. Nah. That's what I just told you. It didn't work. No, I'm teasing. You know I'm playing. Loved ones, we are going through some of the most difficult times. And the battle is right up here. I'm not talking about positive thinking, but you've got to settle some things in your heart because you need that attitude gauge to work. If, if it's not working, you may be in situations where the sky and the ocean look just alike. And you know what that pilot told me? He said, you know, he said, it wasn't always the blue of the sky and the blue of the water that mingled. He said, one time it happened to me at dusk in a storm and the storm and the ocean looked equally dark. Loved ones, I just want you to know that our Heavenly Father knows where you are. And he says, it won't always be this way. I don't know how long. I don't know when it will change. But I can tell you this, the last thing you want to do is make God your adversary. And make God your enemy. I don't say that because you don't, you don't, you don't mess with God. That's not what I mean. That's good advice, but that's another sermon. 
I'm trying to tell you, nobody loves you like he loves you. And nobody understands you like he understands you. I, I told you one time about my dog that was my, my big buddy growing up. And the dog got its collar hung on a fence thing. And it was hanging. Its bottom legs could just barely touch the ground. But his, his collar was stuck on a fence that he had tried to climb. And he was choking to death. And my instinct, my instinct was to go and pick up the dog, take the pressure off, get my buddy to unhook him and set him free. But you know what that dog did? He tried to bite me. Every time I tried to help him, he tried to bite me because he was in panic. He didn't understand what was going on. He had jumped fences all of his life and he'd never got stuck midair. And I watched my dog choking to death until we finally figured out how to muzzle him and pick him up and get him loose. But I nearly lost him before it happened. Sometimes we lash out and don't realize that the people we're trying to bite are trying to help us. God will never hurt you. He is too wise to be mistaken. He is too kind to be cruel but he is also too good to do it the wrong way. You've all heard stories of a child that had an inheritance. Maybe the parents died and he was left with an inheritance that was put into a guardianship and into a trust fund. And that, that parent, maybe knowing they were dying, did something that that child did not understand there might have been an inheritance of $50 million and every 14 year old is sure they know how to manage you know, $50 million. But a parent knows better. And so they put it in a trust and they do several things. They put it in a place that is safe so nobody can steal the inheritance. They put it under the leadership of somebody that is trustworthy and loves the child so that the money won't be mismanaged. And they put it in a place so that the child receives it at strategic increments. They may receive some of it at 18. They may receive a little more at 21. They might receive more at 25. And then at 30, they come into their full inheritance. And everything that the father did was not to dangle that in front of the child. It was not to torment the child. It was to let the child know, I know things you don't know. I've been through things you haven't been through. I know dangers that you know nothing of. So I am going to take these precious promises that belong to you and I am going to safeguard your life so that you step by step come into your inheritance. Loved ones, I don't know if that's what's going on in your life, but it may be something like that. It may be that you are saying, God, I need this and I need this and I need this. And God has every intention of giving those things to you. But he knows that he has to mature you to a point that you're able to handle it. And I know all of that just makes people mad. If you want to make people mad, talk about sovereignty of God. I understand. But loved ones, this pastor is aching for you. This pastor is crying for you. I know the heart of a grandparent. I know the heart of a parent. I know the heart of a friend. And I know that some of you are going through difficulties that no series on fullness will fix. You've got to find that place, go into it, shut the door Take it so seriously, it's like you're hiding away with God till the indignation passes. I tell you who the winners in 2022 will be. It will be those that learn to wait in His presence. Not just wait, because sometimes it's time to stop waiting. But that's another sermon. I have to learn some things. I am going to have tribulation. I must seek the presence, not just date the presence. 
I must expect the Holy Spirit to give me mid-course corrections. And I've got to remember in the darkest of moments, see, we all have highs and lows. In the darkest of moments, I've got to know it's not always going to be this way. Well, it's been this way so long. I know, I know. But I'm telling you, it's not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be this way. You're not always going to be saying, Lord, why not? One day you're going to say, Lord, thank you. One day you're going to say, Lord, I understand. And you know what? Someday will come. You may not say, Lord, I understand. You may say, Lord, I still don't understand, but I trust you. Thank you. Thank you. I know good will come from this weight. I can't talk you into this. Nobody can talk you into it. It's an attitude thing that you have to decide. And I'll tell you this, attitudes are only fixed in the secret place. It's the only place I've seen attitudes get fixed. I've, I've, I've seen this go to other places and have a better day. But the only place an attitude is fixed is in the presence. Pastor, you, you said it may take a long time. Yeah, so enjoy the presence. Enjoy the presence. Enjoy the seeking. But it's your choice. Father, as we end today, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to visit us, whether we're watching at home, whether we're in Brown Chapel, Sanctuary, wherever we are. Maybe we're watching this later in a hotel room or in the park somewhere. I, I don't know, but I believe you are going to bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to the point where they are equipped to walk through these tough days ahead. And Lord, we may see the worst days out of all of them, but it's not always going to be that way. Lord, if I can say this without sounding like something off a Hallmark channel. Lord, I believe we can walk anywhere as long as you walk with us. I believe we can endure anything as long as you walk with us. So Lord, we're going to enter your presence and that will be our go-to place. We're done with Moab. We talked about that last week. But Lord, even in the holy place, trouble comes, but it won't always be that way.